Please, could I ask you for another one of those warm receptions to welcome to the stage Dr. Simon Moore. Forty floors up, and a psychologist is going to start asking you questions. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Okay, so my job is to kind of get you to think about things in probably a different way. Some of it's going to be uncomfortable. I warn you now. Luckily, you've only got 20 minutes of me, so it's, you can grit your teeth. Um, so let's ask you with a very easy question. So how many of you have got a friend? <laughs> Who's got more than one friend? You're just showing off now. Okay, right. So now, think about your friend or friends. How did they become your friends? Was it on the size of your earlobe? How many teeth you had? How tall you are? You're hoping not now. Yeah? Well, they're quite pragmatic, practical features. That's data. What, why do you think you like them and they like you? Is it beyond that? Is it how they make you feel? Is it the fact that you can ring them, they make you laugh? They can answer your questions, make you feel secure? More of an emotional kind of relationship? Or are you thinking, no, my earlobes are pretty cool? <laughs> right, so who's selling stuff here? Who's in a brand who's selling stuff? Okay. Now, it be, I, for me, I just sometimes I have to practice my poker face in the fact I look at what all you guys are doing, and as a psychologist, I just want to slap my forehead because half of you are doing it the wrong way, half of you don't even know what you're doing, to be quite frank, and the other half, how many of you have got loads of data but you don't know what, to, you've got more questions now? Who's got more questions? You've got lo you did loads of data and now you don't know what to do with it, to be honest. Okay, about 10 of you who are going to be honest with me. All right, okay, so, so we need to think data is important, it can be useful, but maybe we don't need to lead with data. I'm, I can see I'm going down really positively to start with, right? So, the point is that you have one big enemy, okay? And your enemy, as a salesperson, member of the brand, whatever it might be, is that you need to sell stuff. Unfortunately, whether it's B2B or B2C, our brains do not work in the way that you think they do. And I'm including everyone, me included. Even though I don't know about this kind of stuff, I still do these things. Okay, so the fact is that you're building and you're communicating and you're messaging out loads of stuff, and it's probably not the right way you need to do it in terms of engaging people. Okay, and I'm going to, for the next three minutes, I'm going to make you feel really stupid now, okay? So bear with me a little bit. Right, look at this picture. Do you recognize the face? Yeah, same person in both pictures? Who, some of you are saying no. Who's saying no, they're not the same person? They're not the same person. They are the same person. Exactly the same person, but actually if I flipped it around, not the same features. I'm showing you data. How many of you didn't realize that was what you were watching or seeing when the upside down, bit, right? So I'm giving you data, fact, but you're translating it in the wrong way. Your brain is not doing what the data, if I, a lot of you assume if you give someone data, they just take it as data and they do something logical with it. That doesn't work. Let's give you another example then. How many F's for Freddy are in this sentence? Very quickly. That's not quick. Two, three, four, five, seven. How many of you are in the room? No, look around, there are not many of you. I'm getting lots of different data points from a very finite audience. This isn't a complex thing, it's a sentence I'm showing you. <laughs> there are six F's in that sentence. And now you're thinking, what on earth is he talking about? <laughs> okay, the Fs you probably missed are in the word of. Oh. Okay, I'm making a point. How many of you give your audiences quite complex things to think about, and particularly in subscription? Who's giving someone more than one sentence to think about? 
Right. Are you now thinking, oh shit? <laughs> you should be. Because if you go wrong with one sentence, the stuff that you're doing is actually quite complicated and you're asking their brains to actually stop, put down everything else, really concentrate on what you're giving them and actually, am I really kind of perceiving this in the right way? So, how many would you would you say that your lives are probably like this? Okay. So, you are just another plate to them. You are not everyone puts all the plates down. I need to listen to exactly what you're telling me. Yeah, that's quite egotistical. You've got to hope that you are one of those plates. Most of the time, you won't even get on that picture. Okay, because... We have capacity. Your brain has capacity. We don't use it to the best capacity, but there's a limit. Yeah. So, and one of the reasons, how many of you have been midway through a sentence and thought, why am I saying this right now? Right. There's your non-conscious coming in, because most of what you do, as we shall see in a second, is you're not even aware why you're doing it. Okay, so you're giving people conscious things to think about, arguments, facts, figures, prices, to be fair to you, maybe if you're lucky, 20% attention goes towards that stuff. Most of it goes on how you make them feel, and half of it is from their experience about how they interpret what you're giving them. So the fact is, you're, you're in a problem world, sorry to say. Yeah. Now, the good news is that I'm not saying you need to tear everything up and throw it all away and start again. What I'm saying to you is, if you use more of the psychology stuff, you can be more impactful for what you're doing because you know when to do it and what to do. So we talked about buzzwords I hate are, sorry, personalization. <laughs> if you say to a marketing person, we want you to personalize everything, they will go out, literally throw themselves off this building right now. How, there's not many of you here. How the hell am I gonna offer all of you a personalized experience? That to me sounds like a hard job. Personalization is, is kind of, it's not the right word. What we mean is, amongst you all here, you actually have more commonality as a human than you do difference. And I know we all love to think that we're a lovely, exciting individual. We are sometimes, but most of the time, we are quite similar. So in actual fact, I can divide you all up into more basic things. So, I, so who writes lists here? Oh my God. Right, okay, so. The question is then, the night before, so when, what do you do? Wake up in the morning and look at your list. Is that what happens? Okay. How do you know to look at your list if you haven't written it on the list? Should you not put it on the list? Anyway. So, so you guys are quite about control. How many of you wake up and think, right, let's just see what the world throws at me? I quite like that. Okay, so you're a different, you're a different kind of psychology area. But these are basic needs. So who doesn't like knowing what's going to happen next? How many of you hate kind of chaos, unexpectedness? Who likes to, I know exactly what's happening. Who, like, who hates going in a room and thinking, what, 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 what do I do? Who loves going in a room going, yeah, look at me. This is going to happen. Okay, so, but that is not personalization. That is needs. And we all have needs, which I'll get to in a bit. That's how you think about stuff. So for personalization, for example, how do you meet the need of control? How are you, what you shouldn't be doing is taking control. Someone who has a high need for control, they don't want a brand to come in and go, I'm in control as a brand. That's the worst thing you can do with them. Because they go, well, you're not for me then, because you're not making me feel comfortable. I want to be in control, yeah? You can help me as a brand to do that, but don't come in and tell me all the stuff to do. I don't want you to do that. So if you take a finance, for example, the worst thing a finance company can say to a group of people who have a high need for control is, we will be smart with your money. Because they'd be like, I don't want you to be smart with your money. Oh, well, I want to be smart with my money. You're taking all the glory away from me. No, 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 I go to another brand now. Okay, so personalization is quite interesting. I think we've kind of misconstrued what we mean by that. The nice thing is it's actually a lot simpler than what you think it is. The other word I hate is frictionless. What have you got in here, hopefully? A brain, yeah? What does your brain not like to do? Nothing. It's the organ that is the most active organ in your body. It likes to do something, yeah? 
you have to give it value. It gives feedback. So this is why we like, so the other thing from an evolutionary point of view is your brain likes to interact with other humans. So you've got your, so we go, who's got friends again? Okay, so what do you do? Would you rather go down to the pub or a bar or a restaurant and face the person and talk to them? Or would you rather cook separate meals and text each other from separate locations? So this is the other problem I have with digitalization and AI. It's useful, but let's not, we've got to be careful. Your brain's not designed to not deal with other humans. That's how it gets its feedback. Okay, so you, you have to kind of think about how do you incorporate some area of looking in someone's eyes. So there's great brands out there, for example, that do all this health stuff. You can go online and they can actually work out what's wrong with you. What happens next? You make an appointment with the doctor. Not for the doctor to say, yes, that's right, but to get reassurance from the doctor that it's going to be okay. A machine can't do that. Okay, so there's, there's, you have to think about how do you bring in the air, we talked about trust, how do you integrate those systems? So look, there's lots of brands here that we're kind of working with that do a lot of the psychology stuff. They kind of know it's important. So it's, it's becoming, we heard today that this sort of stuff is actually coming to the fore now. And I think there's going to become a pivotal moment where people either go completely down the digital road and come unstuck, or they think about, yes, digital can be important, but how do we integrate the more personalized stuff with it from a psychology point of view? So, question you need to ask, if nothing else, is why? Why does someone want to subscribe to you? Why are they not subscribing to you? It's not the what, it's the why. If you're not asking the why, you're not going to get anywhere. Okay, so data, yes, useful, but maybe you're asking the wrong types of questions to get the wrong data. You are, have to understand why would someone buy some food? Why would someone subscribe to an online beauty thing? What's, what's, what's in it for them? What's the reason? What's the need there? If you don't meet the need, you've just got facts and figures. And I've just shown you that facts and figures are very unreliable about how you interpret them. Right. Beach. Quickly look at this picture and think about where would you like to be in this picture. <clears throat> Who's chosen there? How did I know that? Now, now that I've highlighted this area, how many of you now want to get out of the water? So who was in the water here? And now who's thinking maybe I should get out of the water? Not sure what's in that space. Who's, who doesn't like sharks and stuff like that? Who was thinking about here? Okay, now, what brands do is they market this, the positive quick pleasure. This is what you're gonna get immediately and it's gonna feel really good. Okay, now, the fact is that probably about 40% of humans are not looking for reward to start with. They're looking at risk. They're, the way their brains work is, what's the risk involved in this? You can tell me all the nice things, but you haven't told me what the risk is. So you can keep going on and on and on now about how great we are and how cheap we are and how great quality we are, but you haven't highlighted what the risk is. If you talk about subscriptions, what is the risk? And if you tell me the risk, and you also tell me how you're managing that risk, then I'll listen to all the positive stuff. So at the moment, you're what? You've got a third of the audience listening if you're just saying, subscriptions will give you all these lovely things. It's not talking to this audience. And you have to be careful how you talk to this audience. This audience are about long term. What's going to happen if I do this over the longer term? Where's it going to take me? What's it going to do for my reputation, my status? So we have to think about how we reposition kind of material and data. You need to think on a psychology level how that will engage someone. So look, and this is what I mean. When you talk about brands and subscription, yes, you've got a product, but everyone else has got a product. You all talk about differentiation, but you're all copying each other. Gets even more positive, huh? But if you do these things, that's, this is where you get the personalization, this is where you can tailor your data, and this is where you can actually offer differentiation. So what does your brand offer someone? Is it about maintaining their power? Is it about making them feel safe? What's your message to them? Yeah, all right, your product does this, 
from a pragmatic features-based point of view, but from an emotional engagement point of view, what is it you're offering? If you think about your friends again, they offer you something, don't they? Whether it's security, whether it's kind of like, I don't know, humor. Yes, they've got features like arms and legs and eyes, but that's not what drives the friendship. It's what they're offering you. So, so you are a commodity to your friends. It sounds very shallow, but that's what you are. Some of you are funny, some of you are supportive, some of you are just get invited along because they go, at least I'm not like that. <laughs> but, but that's what I kind of mean, yeah? So look, and it works. So this is uh, Ted Baker, and we kind of worked with Ted Baker. They were a bit confused about, they had loads of data, lots of data points. They wanted to think about subscription, and as a result of the subscription, they also wanted to think how would they might grow their market in terms of the market share. And what we found using the kind of things I've been talking about is that actually when you boil it down, their market and their audiences in the UK and in kind of America, there's only three needs that actually encompass thousands of people. So we actually surveyed 20,000 people from a psychology point of view, and we found out that actually there are only three groups. They subscribe to one of three. Yeah, so the first group, for example, was about kind of ego. So people were going into Ted Baker and buying stuff to make them feel better. They'd had a bad day, a bad week, something bad, bad, bad had gone wrong. They would buy a little thing to make them feel good about themselves. Then there were the social peacocks. These are the people who would use Ted Baker as a brand to show off. And then you had the power people. So they'd go in and buy a nice suit from Ted Baker and go, look at me, I can afford nice clothes, you should be listening to me. I know what I need, I know what I want, and I'm quite powerful. Once we kind of found that, and then we went back and we looked at their subscription information, we looked at their marketing, and we looked at their sales online and offline and repositioned it to talk the language of these three people. So we took a pair of jeans, and in that description on the webpage, we actually said three things that would actually speak to these three people. In the next six months, they had massive increases in sales, subscription rates, and also reduction in churn rates. And when they followed up and asked people why, they were saying, well, now you're, you understand me. It's not about the genes, it's about me as a person and what the genes mean to me. And I buy into that emotional link now. I don't care about price. How many, how many of you got feedback that your things are too expensive? Forget it. That's a really good excuse, isn't it? How are you gonna argue with that? Ask the customer, it's too expensive. No, it isn't, yes it is. No, it isn't, yes it is. And customers know that you cannot push back on that. If you under, under, kind of look, investigate underneath, it's probably other reasons why they're saying it's expensive, but it's not the real reason. So you're actually getting skewed data back. So be careful. So how do we make decisions then? Shockingly, probably 90% of the time in your life today, you're not even aware Maybe even 20 of you are listening to me. The rest of you are thinking, what am I doing this afternoon? Oh my God, I've got that horrible meeting. Am I going to make it in time to get the kids? Whatever it might be. Okay? Not much of the time are you consciously aware of what's going on. Yet, what do you guys do? You market and sell and do information that is actually based on conscious responding. I love this picture. It just shows you how irrational, I hate that word as well, but how irrational we all are. I mean, I understand it if they're on the 40th floor. What is it, 12 steps? Maybe they're pacing themselves before they go into that. Anyway. So, and the reason that is, is because you've got two decision-making systems. Okay, you've got a very quick, intuitive one. You've, already, you've established already that people haven't got time. And when we haven't got time, what do we do? We make quick decisions about something, don't we? Someone walks in a room, they've got orange trousers on. Okay, they're either a escape convict, they're fancy dress, they're doing a dare, or they're colorblind, whatever it might be. But you've already labeled them, yeah? That's what we do. Your customers do the same to you. They look at you, go, mm, not for me. And that's an emotional decision. It's not like, okay, let me just get a coffee and let me consider all your arguments carefully for half an hour. That does not happen. And this is why, it's because your brain is devoted to a, this kind of emotional kind of waiting. Why do people buy papers? It's because it, it supports how they feel. They're not interested in facts and figures. What they're interested in is, 
Are you going to support how I feel, I feel comfortable now? I feel relieved. It's not the facts and figures they're looking at. Who's got glasses here? If you were just selling glasses on what they do, fact, and fact is glasses are, help your eyesight, why are we not all wearing the same glasses then? Why are all the kind of frames different colors and different shapes and sizes? Because that is based on emotion. Some of you want to stand out. Some of you want to fit in. Some of you want to look funky. That's an emotional thing. That's nothing to do with how it makes your eyes work. You need to be in this space of how do I need to make someone feel? Is my product emotionally engaging? First, first thing you do, don't worry about facts and figures. They come later. And that's because, look, most of the brain is devoted to emotional processing. It's not about facts and figures. So in actual fact, some of you have got the, the story around the wrong way. Lead with emotions, and then you do your facts and figures. What do you mean to people as a brand emotionally? The other thing, we've touched on this. Some of you didn't really realize this, that actually you are all three split personalities. Okay, this is a problem for you guys because what we do is we think we are our present selves, but most of the time we are fluctuating between who we don't want to be like and who we think we should be like. Yeah, so if I said to you, how honest are you? You'd all go, mm, I'm honest. I don't believe you. But because you're projecting about, I know honesty is a good thing, I should be. That's your ideal self speaking. Yeah, and if I said to you, how many of you could possibly be an axe murderer? You're all going, no, none of you. There's going to be one or two of you who might leap into the kind of, not to worry anyone, but you're going to kind of on the boundaries probably. But you won't admit it because that's your avoidance self. So you have to work out as a brand, what do people want to do to be like and what do people want to avoid? Don't market them on who they are now because they're not in that space most of the time. Their brains oscillate between who they want to avoid and who they want to be like. That's where you need to hit them. How can you make them aspire to be like something? Or how can you make them avoid risk and failure? So, great example of subscription here. Car company, trying to sell insurance, but also sub subscription to them, kind of like newsletters and membership. They more or less said, good drivers, subscribe to our newsletter. Guess what happened to subscription rates? 400% increase, because everyone thinks they're a good driver, huh? It's not a fact and figure, it's a feeling. Yes, well, I'm a good driver. I aspire to be a good driver. Last thing then. Who's in a relationship that they're aware of? <laughs> okay, right, so you've done four lovely things and you're feeling quite smug with yourself? Yeah, have you ever been? Some of you may have never been in that position, so you can only aspire to be it. Right, so you've got four things in the bank that are nice. What happens? You wake up one day, all of a sudden, you've done something irritating. You don't even know what you've done, but you've irritated your partner. What happens to your four lovely things that are in the bank? Do they stay in the bank? Or do they evaporate? Unfortunately, they evaporate, don't they? And that's how the, the brain places emphasis on negative, because it's looking for risk. Okay? You guys sell positive, positive, positive. Look at us, look at us, we're great. What you should be doing is looking through and eradicating all the negative things that act as barriers about why they would engage with you, because that is actually more kind of, the investment in that brings greater ROI than all the lovely things that you might offer them. It's reduce all the risk error. That's where the money is if you want to start somewhere. And I'm conscious of the fact that we're running out of time now, so I'm going to kind of, as you could be aware, I could talk about this all day. I've had to do 50 years of psychology in 20 minutes, unfortunately. Um, so kind of just to leave you this, these are the sort of steps I would advise. You've got stuff and you've got data. I'm not saying to get rid of it, but I'm saying maybe you're not putting it in the right order with the right emphasis. I've shown you that your brains don't work properly. You do not consider fact. You do not take facts and just process them as facts. You do your perception of a fact. Your customers, B2B, B2B are doing exactly the same. They're doing their perception of what You've spent all afternoon doing your lovely argument. They spent 30 seconds considering it. You've got to get them in that 30 seconds. Uncomfortable, but it's the truth. And you can apply this stuff in any areas. 
You can do marketing, retention, subscription. As long as you know some of the psychology stuff, then you can work with the data people or the digital people to say, that's what you should be doing and doing it that way. Now I've made you feel really bad and kind of your brains are not working. I'll hand it back to Rick. Thank you very much. <laughs>